In the next few years, Rio will host the Olympics and the World Cup. But before the city takes the world stage, Brazil has got to fix a major power shortage. Brazil had one of the worst blackouts in history, leaving over 60 million residents without power nationwide. A crew of 3,500 is hard at work on one of the largest hydroelectric power plants ever built. To generate enough power, the team is taking a river with more water than the U.S. uses in a single day, and they're moving it. If you hit a mountain, you go through it. Exactly. To reroute 16 miles of river, they're blasting their way through seven mountains, creating the largest tunnels on the planet. So we've got to remove this rock obstacle. Yes. We're not using a shovel to do it, are we? <laughs> With all eyes on Rio, come on, come on. Brazil is determined to keep the games from going black. Go, baby, go. No stop signs. Let's go. Welcome to Rio de Janeiro, the crown jewel of Brazil. Located in the southeast corner of Brazil on the Atlantic Ocean, Rio is home to six million people, the second largest city in South America. This city is famous for Carnival, the single largest party in the world, samba dancing, and Christ the Redeemer, the enormous iconic sculpture perched atop Cocovado Mountain. Soon, Rio will be known for something else, as only the third city in history to host both the World Cup and Olympic Games back to back. The entire world will be watching this city when over four billion people tune in to see the games. The problem is, Rio may not be ready because this city suffers from blackouts. But just one month after winning their Olympic bid, Brazil suddenly went dark in one of the largest blackouts in human history. For five hours, 60 million people were without power. With 750,000 tourists attending the games and over two thirds of the planet watching on TV, the people of Rio are desperate to keep the lights on. So as someone who's from Brazil, what does it mean to be a part of this bid, of this Olympic well, Games. that's a unique opportunity. Right. Because if we didn't win this time, wouldn't be probably in my generation that this opportunity would be open again. So this is a bigger event than Carnival. Way bigger. Carnival's the biggest event in Rio. Yes. So this will be more lights, more people. More lights, more people, more tourists, more buses, more infrastructure running the system. Yes. The city has less than four years to generate enough energy to power two marquee events. Their solution lies three hours north of the city, where they're building a massive hydroelectric power plant deep in the mountains. So I've just arrived in the town of Sapacaya, and I'm about 100 miles outside of Rio. And it's this town sitting on this body of water that's the site for the new hydroelectric project. One of the largest infrastructure endeavors on Earth the Anta and Simplicio project is a job site larger than Manhattan. Workers here are reshaping some of Brazil's most difficult landscape in order to harness the energy from this. The Paraiba do Sul, a nearly 700 mile long river that will supply the hydroelectric plant with enough water to fill a thousand football stadiums. But the location of the river is the project's greatest challenge. Now, the issue is that they put the hydroelectric plant right here. The reservoir required to feed this plant would cause a big flood, a flood so large that it would destroy all of the forests here and require this entire town and two others to have to relocate. So instead of moving the people, what they're going to do is move the river. To save the town of Sapakaya, engineers are doing something incredible. Changing the course of 16 miles of this winding river in one of the largest water moving efforts since the Panama Canal. Starting with a dam, they're diverting the river through 13 canals, five reservoirs, and tunneling through seven mountains. 
water will safely flow towards three of the most advanced turbines ever built. So the concept basically is you have a river running here, yes. but you need to put it over here. Yes. In between there are mountains and valleys. Yes. If you hit a mountain, you go through it. Yes. If you hit a valley, you build dikes. Exactly. Simple to say. The concept is simple. Build it is very complicated. Very complicated, I imagine. In order to handle 780 billion gallons of rushing water, these tunnels need to be some of the widest ever created. If they're too narrow by even a few feet, the water could back up, causing a devastating flood. Right now, I'm heading in to the mouth of Tunnel 3, the very largest tunnel. And having been in a number of tunnel projects before, I have never seen a mouth of a tunnel this big. Wow. This is the longest of seven tunnels, spanning nearly four miles. And the further you drive in, the farther you get from daylight, and the darker and weirder it gets. In total, workers have to remove over 45 million cubic feet of rock, enough to cover Central Park in over a foot of earth. Going in. With the weight of a 240-foot mountain above, the team has developed a safe way to build one of the largest tunnels in the world. It's a two-step process. Step number one is what you see they've already done. They blasted out this entire 26-foot tall semicircle. The second step is to go straight down. So basically, we're going to drill holes and blast down an additional 26 feet. OK, and so how many holes do we have in this field right here? Here we have 52 holes. 52 individual holes. Yeah. And, and how much explosives are you putting into each individual hole? Uh, in the middle, we put 40 kilos per hole. Uh -huh. So when we're done today, this will look like that. Correct, exactly, yeah. We're not using a shovel to do it, are we? <laughs> what we're using is a liquid explosive. Each 20-foot hole is filled with nearly 90 pounds of the stuff. OK, so Marcel, he's holding a hose connected to a truck, mixing together explosive liquid. Yeah, it's a liquid. It's a mix. So it's like you have to put in a little bit of oil, a little bit of vinaigrette, and you make an emulsion, and it makes your salad taste good. This is different. It's not salad. It's a bomb. Correct. <laughs> Whoa, there she is. This kind of tapioca, like gooey substance, is actually the emulsion, the liquid ammonium nitrate, the water, and the oil. This is a bomb. It's explosives. I have a uh, hose full of it. Going down, all the way down. Made on site, this explosive liquid emulsion is more stable than dynamite. OK, I'm at the bottom. Give me the juice. It fills all the empty space in each drill hole, giving the explosion the maximum force needed to break up the rock without causing a cave-in. So as the explosive comes out of my hose, we're slowly pulling it out, filling this thing up. Is it full? Yeah. All right, so now we have 52 individual holes. Each and every one of them is loaded with a fuse and an entire column full of this liquid explosives. Now, we're going to tie them all together and run away. The holes are dug in five lines. Blast engineers connect the fuse in each hole with a series of color-coded time delays. Once detonated, each line of explosives blows up in succession. Like a wave, it pushes through the next 30 feet of rock. OK, so Kaido, am I looking at the plan right now? Are we looking down? Yeah. So this isn't just one gigantic bomb going off. No, we cannot do this because of the vibration. If you explode everything, you will shake the tongue. Bad idea. Yeah, it's not a good idea. Not a good idea. All right. Voila. OK, so. Each color corresponds to a different delay. So which is which? 30. 30 milliseconds. 150. 150 milliseconds. And so basically, by mixing and matching and combining these delays, we can kind of create the shape of the explosion we want. Yeah, that's it. All right, Jack Bauer, let's do it. This is what it's about, right? Right below me is one column full of explosives. When it goes off, there'll be a 50 millisecond delay, and it goes on to the next hole. OK. Stick it in, and now you can feel the wires touching the charge. And now I'll take this red piece, and it's in. OK? Live. Live explosives. Uh, let's get out of here. All 37 delays are now connected. The strategic blast pattern is ready to go. So once we light the fuse, how long do we have? 
you have seven minutes to leave the tunnel. Okay, so <laughs> we're gonna evacuate the tunnel. Yeah. Getting all the lights, the crew, the gear, everything out. Yes, correct. But not everything is evacuating. The intrepid Danny Cam is gonna try and capture the moment for us. You see, the last time we tried this, our camera did not survive the blast. Hoping for a bit better luck this time. All right, looking good. All right, you are set. All right, be careful where we step. Okay, that's a bomb. That's another bomb. Okay, so in my hand I have um, a stopwatch with seven minutes set for the blast time. In my right hand, I have a lighter. Both are required to safely detonate a tunnel. So, okay, here we go. Fuse is lit, fuse is lit. Come on, come on. Philippe, get in the back, hold on tight. Jay, get inside, quick. Philippe, you're good? All right. Lights on. All right, here we go. Oh, emergency brake. <laughs> right. The mouth of the tunnel is over two and a half miles away, making it almost impossible to reach in just seven minutes. We're gonna make a left here. Good thing they told me that. Okay, gotta change gear. Sorry, dude. Our only way out is a small access tunnel located a half a mile from the blast site. This is ridiculous. So I'm actually driving as fast as I can, but the roads are really crappy, so the idea is don't get a flat. Oh, come on. Come on. There it is. We're almost there. I can see the light. A minute and a half to go. Come on, car. Come on. Get up there. Come on, damn it. You okay, Philippe? That was not seven minutes. <laughs> How many minutes? Uh, the phone jumped out of my hand. I was driving uh, so crazy. Six? six. six? Five? Five. That wasn't six. That was five. <laughs> so the blast might have gone off a bit early. But the delays created the expected chain reaction of controlled explosions, putting them 30 feet closer to redirecting the river. Coming up, what happens when one of the largest tunnel pieces in the world doesn't fit. I think we're stuck. Brazil is the most visited country in South America. Tourism is one of its fastest growing industries, nearly tripling in the last 10 years. And Rio de Janeiro is at the center of it all, with an annual event twice the size of Mardi Gras. Carnival is the single largest party in the world, with over 700,000 tourists descending on this city, partying nonstop for four days straight. Now, to put this in perspective, during the Olympics, you'll have that many people and more in this city for not four, but 16 straight days of events. Imagine the televisions, all the air conditioning, all that samba dancing. The electrical loads on this city will be unprecedented. The Olympics will bring 750 thousand more people to Rio, taxing an already strained power grid. To keep the lights on, the Anta and Simplicio hydroelectric project will supply nearly twice the energy that the city needs for the games. To generate that much power, workers are moving a massive river through a series of tunnels and canals, channeling all that water to an intake valve that directs the river to a powerhouse. As this enormous wall of redirected water comes out of the final canal, it now meets something called an intake, which is essentially like the drain at the bottom of a really big bathtub. But while the water drains out, something else has to hold back all that remaining water. Now we're talking about 780 billion gallons of water. What can hold back that much water? Well, it's gotta be a really, really big wall. This massive wall is over 100 feet tall covered in over 4,000 tons of concrete. Its core is reinforced with nearly 75 tons of steel rebar, making it 100 times stronger. So at this height, I'm basically at the midpoint of the intake. Water would be going in below where I'm standing, down into the hole. But up here, the wall that's holding back the rest of the water is right here. And the guys that are actually building this thing, giving it its strength, installing its rebar, 
Well, they're doing that up there. Well, here we go. We're off. This is one of the hardest spots to reach on the entire job site. One tied off. Workers have to climb a steep 79 degree slope. Not looking down. 10 stories up. All right, last couple. Okay. Woo! Top of the summit. How you doing? I'm Danny. Hello. Hello. Who's this over here? Cleope. 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 Cleope and Aldo. Okay, Cleope and Aldo are gonna be my two teammates as we install some last bits of rebar in the very top of this wall. It's gonna hold back hundreds of billions of gallons of water. That's a lot of water. See? See? So the crazy thing is at this height, at the very height of the wall, the way to get more rebar up to us so we can finish this wall is like that. There's no room for a crane at the top. So a team of six workers hoist each 65 pound piece of rebar. Holy, you gotta be kidding me. Using nothing but 160 feet of rope. All right, okay. Watch out, watch out, watch out, watch out, watch out. All right, come down, watch your shoulder. Come down by me. Okay, we're at the right height. And now the rebar is generally where we want it. Now we put on those series of indomitable rebar ties to connect this horizontal piece to this vertical piece. Around the top. When finished, this crew will tie together almost 5,000 pieces of rebar. Bring in the tool, twist. Creating a massive grid with over 17,000 joints that will stop a river in its tracks. Nice, good stuff. Yeah! So, why is everyone so happy? Why so much, woo! Today is Saturday. Today is Saturday, I see. Which means tomorrow's no work. No, we got it. All it takes is a day off. Brazil just blows up. There it is. <laughs> oh my God, it's like a prison break out here. Uh, well, it just goes to show just how hard these guys have been working. Six days a week, almost 16 hours a day to build what will be one of the most important pieces of infrastructure ever to be built in Brazil. And why? To make sure this city, when it houses both the World Cup and the 2016 Olympics, they don't have a blackout. Engineers expect a wall of water nearly 100 feet deep to barrel into the intake wall. After the water passes through, it drains at the base of the wall and enters three underground tunnels called penstocks, which begin with a 10-story drop to speed up the water. It gains momentum down a seven-degree slope rushing towards the turbines. The faster the water, the more electricity they generate. So that's the turbine down there. Yes. And the central idea with the penstock is to do what to the water? Increase the speed and the pressure. Both needed to move the turbines. And so the water's moving how many meters per second? 10 meters per second. 10 meters per second, so that's like, like 20 miles an hour. Yes. Water moving that fast would tear away rock from the walls and ceiling. Its force is stronger than a massive ocean wave and capable of causing a tunnel collapse. To reinforce the penstock, workers line the final 350 feet with 50 massive rings, totaling 800 tons of solid steel. Now, one of the fascinating parts of this process is they're moving a big, heavy object, but they're not using a crane because we're in a tunnel, right? There's no room for a crane. So rather than having a crane operator, we have a truck driver and an angry one. Let's go meet him. All right, here we go. Hello, sir. How are you doing? You know me? Anderson. Anderson. Used to. I'm Danny. I'm Danny. Danny, nice to meet you. Are you nervous? Heavy piece, we're in a tunnel. Yeah, you want that? Keep it cool. Let's do it. Rock and roll. All right. The ring is attached to a trailer and is more than half the weight of the truck. It'll take everything this truck has to get it into place. OK, so Anderson wants to crank the RPMs up because he's actually going to want a ton of torque to stay on the truck so the weight of that steel piece doesn't actually drag the truck backwards. She's letting the engine tune up. Also, I might add, from afar, Anderson, very tough exterior, kind of tough truck driver appeal. But here in the cab, this guy's a teddy bear, huh? There he is. He loves it. He loves it. All right, here we go. So we're popping it in gear. Wow, 
I mean, Anderson is basically smacking into the back of the steel ring and quite literally pushing it. It's a kind of a tight fit. Uh-oh. Oh, my god. Look at that. Um, I think we're stuck. Are we stuck? So what happened? Yeah, it's hit the pedra. You hit it? Yeah. Is that okay? I got to take the machine to push it. Smacked it. Well, it happens. I mean, if you're basically parking like what is an enormous truck with a gigantic 16-ton steel tube, you might hit the side of the garage. Anderson did. It happens. Let's go check it out. It takes three days to secure each ring to the tunnel wall. And the crew has three penstocks to complete and another 146 rings to install. But for now, this operation has come to a grinding halt. So there's a flange on the outside of the steel that kind of protrudes out. And that flange somehow has gotten behind this bump out of concrete. So not only is it stuck on the side of the wall, it's actually blocking itself from getting unstuck. We're going to be here for a long, long time. Up next, sealing the most advanced turbine ever built with a 3,000 degree welding stick. Oh, it's not damp. Sorry. Nice, right, if you touch, touch the rod to any metal. Brazil is the third largest consumer of electricity in the Western Hemisphere, with usage doubling in the last 25 years. This country is turning to its greatest resource, water. There are many different ways to make the electricity we need to power our cities. You can burn coal, you can burn oil, you can build a nuclear power plant, you can have a wind farm, even a solar farm. Now, for a country like Brazil that has one-fifth of the world's fresh water, a water solution makes obvious sense. The Paraiba do Sul is one of over 120,000 rivers in the country. And for the last three years, workers have cleared a new 16-mile path through seven mountains, removing 650 million cubic feet of earth, all to bring that water to three of the most advanced turbines ever built. We are now at the final leg of this race. The water now traveling at its maximum speed is gonna come barreling out of the steel casing, which will ultimately connect to this right here. This thing behind me is called the spiral casing, and this is where the water finally makes electricity. It's gonna spin around this, pulling a 360-degree turn, all the while rotating the blades of the turbine. The turbine acts essentially like a water wheel. As water rushes around the spiral case, it pushes 13 angled blades, spinning the 35-ton turbine and generating power. The challenge, keeping the water from losing speed as it flows around the tube. The answer is the same thing that we use when we're washing our cars with a garden hose, right? If you pinch the garden hose, the water goes faster, right? So if we decrease the diameter of the hose, we increase the pressure of the water. Same principle, just much bigger. The water comes into the spiral casing at a diameter of 13 feet. And as the water goes around the curve, the tube gets progressively smaller, starting at 13 feet and ending at 4 feet. So when the water comes in, it travels the exact same speed all the way around the circle. The 62-ton spiral case is actually composed of 70 steel plates. Coming in, here we go, okay. To make the turbine spin evenly, it must be turned into one smooth, frictionless right. surface by a team of four welders. All right, your name? Quasmi. Quasmi, I'm Danny. Quasmi, you're the welder, huh? So what Quasmi's up to is he's welding on these pad eyes. We'll put one on this piece of steel, we'll put a second one up on this piece of steel, and we're gonna bring it together in order to close the gap between two pieces of steel, weld it up, and make it one smooth curved surface. Okay, let's do it. Gloves. Quasmi's welding stick burns at 3,000 degrees. And to protect against flame and sparks, 
These guys wear welding jackets made of fire-resistant leather. Beautiful. Okay. Okay. All right, you show me how it's done. Put one arm in. And then put the other arm in. Cosme, are you showing me how to put a jacket on? Is that how much faith you have in my abilities today? All right. Oh, right. Sorry, sorry. Nice, right, if you touch, touch the rod to any metal. These pad eyes are welded onto each steel plate to act like an anchor when they pull the steel together. All right, got to get it in there tight. Get a nice little bead going right there. Good motion. Look at that go. Cosme! How was that? That was good, huh? Are you okay? What do you think? Oh, oh. Yeah. The difference between yours and mine, yeah. Uh, that's hard. These panels will be pulled so tightly that each pad eye must endure 18 tons of force. So we're gonna have to have it more weld. Yep. All right, so Crosby's gonna actually finish the thing up. Now, next step is the guys will put chain blocks onto that pad eye. Once we put tension in the line, we can pull the pieces of steel closer together because in the end, they're taking these different individual curved segments and making one long curved tube that lets the water rapidly turn around and spin the turbine. 79,000 gallons of water will rush through the spiral case with nearly the same force as a rocket during liftoff. Powerful enough to rip the one inch thick steel plates wide open. Now to prevent that, the crew must entomb all three cases in over 2,000 tons of concrete. But they have to first make sure the cases don't leak by filling them with water. The problem is you can't fill it with water if you have holes in it. So right now what we're gonna do is plug up the holes of that donut to let them fill it with water. We're gonna do that with this big cylinder right here. The plug is actually a 32,000 pound steel ring. All right, let's shackle it up. And once lowered into place, here. it will seal up the spiral case, making it watertight. Okay, so everything in Portuguese is different from English, even the crane operator instructions. So, for example, going up with the crane? Right up, Sima. Sima. Right up, Sima. And for going down? Right up, All right, so he gives us a thumbs up. Okay, bring her up. Here she comes. 16 tons, wide load. All right, clear the way, we're gonna start traveling. Now, one of the key things to keep in mind when you're flagging a crane operator, no matter where the piece is, no matter where you are, you have to maintain visual connection with him at all times. So, as the piece moves, I have to move with it to make sure we're always looking at each other. And now for the delicate part, we're over top the spiral casing. Each spiral case takes workers two months to assemble. Very slowly. And if this solid 16-ton load falls, it would crush the case like an empty soda can. Now I have the piece above the hole, there's moments of more progressive refinement. We got it this far, and now we're gonna get even closer as the piece gets closer to its final position. Okay, here she comes. Come on down. And now for the final few adjustments, here, literally, millimeter by millimeter, you can see it just coming through the threshold with absolutely no room to spare. Look at that. With only 1 64th of an inch of clearance and a crane operator perched 90 feet up, this way, there is no room for error. Come to me a little bit. Keep it coming. Stop it right there. Good. All right, so now we are lined up all around. The circle should fit into the hole. Check it out. Everyone seems happy, so we're good. We're successful. <laughs> Nobody got them. Yeah. Cool stuff. My first time, my first time operating a crane via hand signals. Did a decent job. Coming up, clearing out nearly four miles of canals. So these are the explosives right here. Calls for some serious firepower. Oh, the noise is so bad. You can hear it's like bomb on bomb action. But first, how many hydroelectric dams are located in the entire country of Brazil? I'll tell you the answer after the break. Here is the trivia answer. Brazil has 450 hydroelectric dams, more than twice as many as in the entire United States. Rio has 1.3 million people 
living in slums called favelas. 20 years ago, these neighborhoods had no electricity. Today, their power comes largely from direct taps into city power lines, an extremely dangerous power source. But thanks to the 2016 Olympics, this situation is about to radically change. One of the more fascinating reasons why Rio beat out their competition of Madrid, Chicago, and Tokyo is that winning the Olympics isn't just about showing off a shining, gleaming city, but rather it's also about using this as an opportunity to transform a place. So this favela, one of the poorest neighborhoods in Brazil, is also going to benefit from the games. All the new infrastructure, all the new construction, all the new housing will affect this area. So winning the Olympics isn't just about sports, it's also about transforming a city. Brazil is spending $14 billion on new infrastructure, changing not only the favelas, but the city's entire power grid, starting with Rio's aging open-air electrical substations. So Rodrigo, this substation is in downtown Rio. I mean, for example, that's a condominium right there. That's an apartment building. People are living all around this thing. Yes. This is totally open? Yes. It's not good. It's not good. It's very, very dangerous, this. But mainly, the problem is it's more vulnerable because you are exposed for our birds, animals, and the ocean salt raining. All of them will generate a blackout. So everything from salt from the ocean. Yes. The rain falling on this thing. Even a pigeon could fly into the substation and the lights go out. Yeah, it's a, a not a good situation. This is not a good situation. Not a good situation. The three transformers in this 50-year-old substation step down the voltage, making it safe for use in the home. They're being replaced with three brand new ones, much smaller and safer. And this, what I'm looking at right here, this is the actual transformer right here. Yes. So we have three of these, and they're able to make the same amount of power as this entire old substation. Yes, it's the same power all of this substation inside this roof and all covered. So it's smaller, it's more efficient, and it's covered and protected. And covered and protected. I like it. Each transformer weighs 77 tons. It's not on, right? It's actually, he's not going to electrocute me? No. And it took the crew and their truck three days to move it off the street. Now, just feet from its final destination, there is no room for a truck. Okay, Guillaume, explain to me our situation, because we're standing inside a transformer bay. Yes. But there is no transformer. No, not yet. But we're going to pull this transformer, and you're going to do this. I am going to pull a transformer. Yes. By hand. By hand. By hand. My hands. Your hands. Not your hands. I can't help you, but I think you can do it. In order to do it, we're just going to, just going to. Yeah, you just have to pull it. Just going to, just give a little. You want to, and that's it? The, yes. For what? Six months? <laughs> Each transformer has to be dragged the final 17 feet using a ratchet pulley system. You can do it, man. It weighs more than a tank, and each crank moves the transformer just two inches. It's like, it's like training for the Olympics here. In, in the transformer movement category, I'm gonna get the goal. Is it moving? Yeah. Do you need uh, some help there? Yes, I heard yes. Do you have some help? Yes. Come on, get in here. OK, let's you go. You, you want the gold? <laughs> You want silver, huh? No, I want gold. Now, actually, it's like figure skating. They have, like, the, the, the couple's breathing. <laughs> it takes 102 strokes of the ratchet to cross the finish line. Oh, oh, oh. Looking good. There it is. Transformer in place. Moved about 17 feet. How? On the backs of champions. In the next four years, 50 more substations like this one will be upgraded bringing power safely into homes. But getting the power to these substations presents an even bigger challenge. Brazil is a country that gets almost all of its power through hydroelectricity. And it would make sense that a hydroelectric plant would be located where the water is. The largest source of fresh water on Earth, the Amazon River Basin, is in the far northwest of Brazil but three-fourths of the population live on the opposite side of the country. Connecting the two regions is a massive network of power lines spanning over 3,000 miles. The issue is those power lines are really expensive to build, 
they're inefficient, and most problematically, they're vulnerable. You're looking at a series of opportunities for blackout. Rio gets most of its energy from a power source nearly a thousand miles away. But now, just a hundred miles from the city, engineers are attempting to harness power from the Paraiba do Sul River by carving a new path for the water through 16 miles of mountains and valleys. The 16 mile journey that the water takes from the dam to get to the powerhouse takes it through seven individual tunnel segments. There are five separate reservoirs, and here where I'm standing is the last and final canal before it goes into the penstock and into the powerhouse. The problem is, naturally, this canal is not wide enough to accommodate that much water. So what do you do? We're gonna take that rock face, and we're gonna blow it up. So we're gonna take this down to that level, and how much further are we going down? 10 meters deep. 10 meters deep, so about 30 feet straight down to create, essentially, a bigger bathtub. Yes, that's it. Let's do it. 30 feet deeper means clearing nearly 6,000 tons of rock. So these are the explosives right here. They're using over 2,300 pounds of explosives, enough blasting power to hit a 2.0 on the Richter scale. And we're going to lower this down the hull and essentially just fill it with these white sausage like explosives. Let's see. Let's do it. One at a time. Just drop them in. You want one at a time. Yeah. It's OK to drop them 30 feet. There's no, no risk. Problem. No it's problem. Not at all. Yeah. Oh, the noise is so bad. The noise, you can hear it's like bomb on bomb action. Each hole is filled with 50 pounds of explosives. And we're in. We're good. All right. The final step before detonation, connect all of the holes together with a single fuse to create one enormous blast. Good? You like it? Let me see that thing. All right, so this is the fuse. So here you can see there's a charge embedded inside of this explosive wire. It's wrapped in good. From there, we have a fuse. You follow the fuse. This distance guarantees us safety. We start running, and hopefully in about six or so minutes, this entire rock face on which I'm standing disappears. I got a fuse. Coming up. We gotta go, we gotta go, come on. Watch we have only three minutes. You okay, you okay? To escape from the biggest blast I have ever seen. We are driving like maniacs to get out of here. Just 1,600 feet of rock separate a river from this hydroelectric powerhouse that could end Rio's energy problems. Nothing that one ton of explosives and a fuse couldn't solve. OK, so right here, 150 centimeters equals how many minutos? Tres minutos. Tres minutos. Three minutes. <laughs> the blast will send nearly 6,000 tons of rock flying throughout the valley. The three-minute fuse leaves us barely enough time to safely clear the blast zone. So the cars are now backing up. All four doors open, so as soon as we let the fuse, pack in the car and go. Yes. OK, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a movie. It's like Cannonball Run here. <laughs> All right. Yeah, as fast as we can. As fast as we can. Yeah. OK, that's cool. The area's being cleared. The siren is going. We're going to light this fuse, and that literally means we'll have three minutes to run into that car and get way away from here, because within three minutes or so, this entire rock mass will start flying in here. Fuse is lit. We gotta go, we gotta go. Come on, come on, come on. Watch your step. Come on. You okay, you okay? We are driving like maniacs to get out of here. Oh boy. Go, baby, go. All right, no stop signs now, no stop signs, let's go. Let's see, minus one minute to go. We gotta get 1,500 feet away from that blast. Work that. No, we're good. We should blow any second right now. Holy. One very large explosion just went off. I think we're gonna find that entire side of that rock face is no more. Well done, fellas. Everybody's alive. Nicely done. We're now going right back into the blast. Look at this. All this white smoke is the debris. We're driving on Mars. Oh, 
my god. <laughs> it's not there anymore. Look at this. It's it's gone. The whole thing is gone. Oh my god. So what was an enormous rock face? Literally an entire chunk of stone is now a pile of rubble awaiting excavation. Fellas! That is a work of art. Fernando the gold medal winner. Olympic champion in blow it up mountains. No, no, it was all you. Beautifully done. <laughs> Beautifully done, sir. Really amazing. That was incredible. It'll take 53 more blasts to shape this 115 foot wide canal and bring 780 billion gallons of water to the powerhouse. The next challenge, keeping it that wide. The issue is this massive earth moving operation is man-made and will over time begin to erode. So today what we're gonna do is apply a system to the side of this canal to make sure no matter what happens, it stays put and does not erode over time. To prevent rain from eroding the sides of the canal, should we head up? Yep. The team must spray the hills with hydro seed. Oh. The homemade solution starts with water, soil, mulch. Yeah, there we go. And a special blend of local grass seed. These are the seeds right here? Yeah, they have about Seven species. So it's this mixture, this blend of seeds that'll actually enliven the soil, give it some strength, and minimize that erosion. Yeah. All right, here we go. Finally, they add a natural fertilizer. This is the good fertilizer. Yeah. This is organic, healthy. Is this poop? It's uh, poop with soil, but it's organic. You know? Yeah, it's poop. It's poop. Organic fertilizer. What I think it was. It's poop. All right, so we have our seven different kinds of seeds. We have our four bags of mulch. We have five bags of organic fertilizer. Are we done? Are we ready to shoot? Ready. All right, let's mix it up and shoot some seed. Ultimately, the team has to spray hydro seed over five million square feet of land. Nearly enough grass to cover Times Square. Oh. Oh, yeah. Workers use a hose with 80 pounds per square inch of pressure spreading over 2,000 gallons of hydro seed in just 30 minutes. Here's the handoff, here's the handoff. I'm stepping in. Hang on. Oh, wait, I'm taking me. My God. Yeah, I got it, okay. It's like I'm fighting a freaking boa constrictor. Come on. Okay. I got it now, there it is. I got it. Don't make it a battle. The crew has just four months to complete all the hydro seeding before Brazil's dry season sets in and the grass won't grow. So in just two months' time, I'm going to see plants that big. Exactly. And it's that grass planted on that hill that will keep the slope in place, minimize erosion, and let that water flow from this side all the way down towards the power station without interruption. This is one of the final steps in a four-year effort to divert a river. Through an incredible 16-mile system of tunnels, reservoirs, and canals. Also, that a powerful flow of water reaches three turbines, giving Rio the chance to show the world their incredible city during the upcoming Olympic Games. Rio will be a radically different city as a result of these games. Yes. It's not just about sports, is it? No, no, it's much more. It's much more. Actually, sport is the first the driver, is what catch the attention, is what catch the passion. Right. But uh, below that, there's much more happening. Rio de Janeiro is going to host both the World Cup and the Olympic Games within a two-year window. And because of this incredible honor, they're going to build new roads, new housing, and new infrastructure, and really change the city. But for me, what makes this hydroelectric project so exciting, even beyond the incredible engineering, is that they're going to give Rio not just the electricity they need, but also the confidence to hold these incredibly public events and do so without the fear of a blackout. And if Rio can pull this off, they're gonna change not just the physical landscape of their city, but also the image of their entire country.